See, the problem when you open up your show to other authors asking questions is that other authors will ask questions. <laughs> I'm absolutely honored to have another episode of Complete Candor, this time with Horrible Writing Writing Support Group member, the Stories We Tell contributor, and author, A.C. Ward. That will that never will work. work. You can't, can't publish it. Seriously? No, 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 no. Oh my God, that's oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. bad. You, you probably, probably should find other hobbies. You ever, you ever want to stop? Stop. stop. Be happy. Quit quit while you're you're you don't. Don't bother me. I've seen better than you. Do you really want to do this? And grow up. Get it up. Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Hey everybody, Paul Sadie and your host. Welcome to episode 95 of Horrible Writing. I hope this finds you well. I'm recording this episode at the end of June. You won't hear it until the middle of July, but it's still summertime, at least those of us on the top of the world. Nice and cold for those of you on the bottom of the world, or comfortably cold, I should say, I hope. So, I opened this up with Dawn Pizzo a few episodes ago. This was her idea to do something like this in this format, and I think it's a wonderful idea. I offered it to you all, the community. Don't be shy, that offer... still stands. You record your audio onto your smartphone, or if you have mics at home into something like that, send them in. I'll answer them to the best of my ability, research them, and of course, give you a platform on a podcast to share your voice so others can find you. Again, just go to paulsating.com, click the contact tab to find out how to get that to me. Now, I like the set of questions that AC Ward sent in because I think it's, it really addresses some high points that I would like to hit, some low points, and, that, and that's the thing, right? Behind empowerment through candor is just being honest and real. Remove the curtain so everybody can see Oz for what Oz is. Not that <laughs> that analogy works on me being Oz, but just, hey, the show was based on empowerment through candor, real talk. You are going to journey through with me through this author journey from know nothing. I mean, I just wrote stories. I didn't know anything about getting published to where I've got three things published, two more coming in the next couple months. I'm going to wait until after the summer when everybody's back into the routine. But within 100 episodes of the show, I'll have five things published, working on the sixth thing. Right? I still have a ton to learn, but I want to share with you as I go. So... Let's do that now. AC, welcome to the show, and hit me with your first question. Hey, Paul. It's author AC Ward. That sounds more legit, right? Anyway, I thought it might be time for another episode of Complete Candor with Paul Sading. So I have a few questions for you. Question one. How's the leg? I hope it's finally healing. If I'm remembering correctly... You heard it again just going for a regular walk. That's not how I imagine it, though. I picture that scene in Misery, the one that makes me cringe. Your inner demon is the crazy fan, telling you that you will finish that sequel. She's only doing you a favor. Wait, aren't everyone's inner demons Kathy Bates? Or is that just me? But I digress. Did the leg injury make you more prolific? From the most recent episode, it sounded like the opposite. Did you learn something new about yourself dealing with this injury? Do you need to be outside to refill the creative well? I guess, what do you think it taught you or what did you learn from it? Okay, we peeked into AC's uh, closet a little bit there with that. And come on, who doesn't love Kathy Bates in like any role she's ever taken, but especially in Misery? Come on. So no, AC, you're not alone. And as far as the leg, uh, I'm recording this again, middle of June, and I'm standing at my standing. I've got a sit-stand desk. I'm standing at my desk instead of sitting. Great. 
I'm also bootless. I'm standing on two flat feet. This is a beautiful thing. I'm actually getting my hips back in alignment. So that's always nice, right? Reducing some knee pain and back pain. <laughs> but on a more serious note, AC asks a great question, and it's very important to hit on. Where you draw creativity from? Where is your creative well? Now, you would think, I tore my Achilles the first time in November of 2018. I tore it a second time in February of 2019, so a couple months later. It is now July. I've literally not been able to do the things that are good for me and my creativity since November. I, once I tore it, I knew I was going to miss snowshoeing. I knew I was going to miss ski season. So I knew I had an opportunity to buckle down and focus on launching the stories we tell, working on the crown of thieves, working on rip the scales and the third subject found book. These things were things I was going to do. And AC is very perceptive. I didn't. What I found myself doing was things I don't normally do. As more and more time passed, as we went through the holidays, we went through the cold, wet, rainy season here in the Pacific Northwest, and I sat inside this house uncomfortably at this desk working and then squeezing in writing, I found myself surfing the internet more. I found myself playing you know, those online medieval war games. I found myself doing non-writing things. To the point where I fell behind schedule. I fell off my rhythm. It was, you know, depressive symptoms for sure. But it impacted my writing in a time that I tried to use the mindset that, hey, this sucks, but I'm going to get a ton of writing done. I might even get the three books out with no problem working on a fourth. Well, now I'm going to be lucky to publish two. And sure. Some of the fact that I'm only doing two this year is due to the fact that I have a new editor and I brought her the scales, which is not an adapted work. It's like it will be my first true raw novel for you all instead of something that's based on an audio drama. And there were structural things and she because she's so good and she's so thorough. There are structural things that I had to fix to make it a better story. And that took time. I've learned I'm going to get better for the next book. But that doesn't change the fact that that happened. But I could have got that done earlier or I could have had Rip done earlier and was now working on that third subject found book. And I didn't. And it's because my creative well had run dry. The things that I use to re-energize, reinvigorate, inspire, reignite that creativity being the physical things were gone. I couldn't do them. I couldn't snowshoe. I couldn't ski. I couldn't even get out and drive until I found um, these cool little pan uh, pedal manipulators to use. So I couldn't do the things that would help me be creative, and I didn't have a fallback plan. So I did have a setback this year. Now, the sun's still going to come up tomorrow if I publish two, zero, or 20. So I don't take these things too seriously, but it is a learning point for me. So hopefully it is a learning point for you as well. Where do you draw your creative inspiration and energy from? Make sure that you do not have a one fail safe system like I do. You know, the fact that I have to do physical things is where I get re-inspired from. What is, what are yours? I hope you can list a few things and then Play that role for yourself. What happens if I can no longer do X? And what's your answer? Don't repeat my mistakes. I've taken up wood whittling now. There's a wonderful member of the Horrible Writing Writer Support Group. If you're not there, why are you not there yet? Robert, love you, who introduced me to wood whittling. And I've taken that up. I suck. I'm horrible. I don't care. It's cathartic. It's wonderful to create something in a different matter matter medium, you know, physically with my hands carving wood. That is very cathartic and very useful. And thankfully, I'm doing that now, but I could have been doing that earlier. 
So now I'm back in a better state. I'm able to walk around. I'm able to drive. I can't run. I can work out, but I can't, you know, do treadmills and ellipticals. I can't go hiking yet, but I'm able to walk the neighborhood without pain. Now I have to go slow. Uh, the Achilles still has a long way to go, but I can still do those things. So I'm in a better place now, but that's very recent. So don't have a one fail safe system, please, for your creativity. I did learn that about myself. I had one and I failed myself and never again will I allow that to happen. All right, on to question two. Crown of Thieves sounds awesome and I'm so excited for you. But how did you decide on going forward with that idea? If you're anything like me, you might have multiple ideas running through your mind. Epic fantasy is so different from horror. I myself have so many stories that cross genres. So far, I've heard one consistent advice. Don't do it. But still, I want to write what's most exciting for me. I don't think it's the best marketing strategy. And inside, Kathy Bates is slapping a whip against her hand because, you know, it has to be a whip. So my question is more, what are your fears about going this route? Do you have a strategy to counteract the lower crossover? Kathy will be looking at me from the corner of the room as well. She'll keep one eye on you and one eye on me, AC. (laughs) But you're absolutely right. Crown of Thieves is going to be an epic fantasy. Think the Wheel of Time, for those of you who love that epic George, uh, Robert Jordan, sorry, Robert Jordan series, or like the Freudian slip, George R.R. Martin, uh, his A Song of Ice and Fire, otherwise known as Game of Thrones series, right? It'll be in that ballpark. So that is vastly different than the 12 stories in 12 Deaths of Christmas or Diary of a Madman audio drama. But AC, I think I, I think you understand this. I feel that you and I have a lot of conversations in the Horrible Writing Writer Support Group. Why aren't you there yet? And it's an important conversation to have, but where I want to start is kind of backing the train up a little bit. Every single Monday in that support group, I ask the group what your goals are, and I ask them to write them as SMART goals. We do short term for the week, but you can do SMART goal setting for a week, a month, a year, five years, right? 10 year plan. You can do that with your smart goal setting. And I ask them to do that every Monday to get in the habit of doing that because it's literally that important. It will drive everything. And when people fall out of love with writing and they get stressed and mad and depressed from it, I argue that's because their behaviors are not matching their goals. That's why. Maybe they haven't even taken the time to establish goals. That's a huge problem, folks. If you're going to do this, If you're serious about writing, whether it's books, comic books, a memoir, a book of poetry or a volume, volumes of poetry or audio dramas, the first thing you have to do, first thing you have to define are your goals. What is your aim? Now, I have those short, medium and long term goals. The long term goal is that I'm going to be able to support myself through my writing my creative ventures. That's a ways off and may never be achieved, but it's still a goal. It's still something I'm going to work toward. Now, how am I going to get there? Well, by publishing a lot, definitely. But one of the key indicators, one of the trends, the key trends, if you will, for an independent, someone like me, and most likely someone like you listening to this and definitely AC she and I are in the same kind of boat, is series. You have to write series. If you, if the financial aspect of that financial independence to be able to write full time, unless you're one of the very, very, very few people who happens to hit it out of the ballpark with that one novel, as an indie, you need to be writing series. So, 
for me to reach my long-term goal of financial independence based on creative endeavors, I have to be able to do that through my writing. How can I do that? Well, I've got to write a series. So I had a decision make to make. Can I write horror series? Well, there's not a whole lot of them out there, or is, is there? And I'm not necessarily inspired. I don't think horror works over a series. Could I do it suspense thriller? Nah, maybe. There may be some future news about a who killed Julie. Uh, if Those of you who don't know, that's an audio drama. Seven episodes out there. You can go find them. Uh, but there's a series that I have for that. That's more of like a suspense, a crime suspense. So I could, but that creative spark isn't there beyond the first and second book for that. So that's something that I'm still allowing to germinate. So I can easily eliminate those two things. Now, what does that leave me with? It leaves me with the subject found series and I have a nice foundation. I get tens of thousands of downloads of that podcast still to this day, June, 2019. And there's just the two full seasons. So 20 something episodes out there but I still get those downloads. So it has a nice foundation. Rip is going to be the second novel in that series. I already have the third season script written. It needs to be adapted to a novel, which is what I'm going to work on once Rip and the Scales are packaged and ready to be published or published. So I have the second, or I'm sorry, I have a series, the Subject Found series, but... It's an anthology, really, because book one is about Bigfoot. Book two is about that other character. I don't want to say anything because spoiler alerts, if I were to tell you what happens, right? So you, you got to go check out the audio drama or more preferably to me to help me out by the novel when it comes out. So an anthologized series, how well do those sell? How much read through is there? I've been doing research and I can't find a a definitive, repeatable evidence base for commercial success for those. And to be honest, empowerment through candor, chasing the demon isn't a strong series lead. The first book in a series. I just this week finished the audio book recording the audiobook for it and let's just put it this way i can tell how much i've grown as a writer <laughs> based on recording that i'm not going to go back and fix that book and republish it no looking forward moving forward always i'm not turning back the things behind me have already happened i keep journeying forward i hope many of you do as well when it comes to this stuff instead of always going back Unless, of course, your goal is to publish a thing that is the most perfect piece of literature you could put out there, then that's fine. My goal is not. My goal, again, financial independence. So looking backwards is not going to help me achieve that. So understanding that it's a series anthology and that lead book, because it says book one of Subject Found Series on it, is not my best writing because it's my first book. I had my choices narrowed down even more, right? So from horror and thriller, eh, not going to do it, not inspired to do a Who Killed Julie series yet, though I'm very excited to. And then understanding I do have a series and I do have an established large audience for it. I can keep doing that, but there's no empirical evidence, repeatable, validated evidence that shows me it would be financially uh, stable enough to help me reach my goals. So as you can see, I start a process of elimination and that leads me to what has always been my first love, which is epic medieval fantasy. I like a lot of fantasy, but some of it gets a little too fantastical for my tastes. And they always say, you know, a lot of successful authors always write something that's successful and they weren't doing it for the success. They were writing a story because they weren't seeing it 
in the public space. They weren't seeing that book out there, so they went and did it. So this kind of ties in a long way the entire answer back to you, AC, and why I'm doing Crown of Thieves, which is a diversion from horror and thriller and dark suspense, which I have been doing. And that's because one, epic fantasy, see, epic fantasy is my first love by a long shot. I love it more than horror uh, by a long shot. And then anybody who knows about fantasy knows that epic fantasy converts very well into a series. Very well. The patrons of this show, of any of my podcasts, if you're a patron of any of my podcasts, it all goes to one place patreon.com forward slash pulsating you can hear the first episode of the crown of thieves audio drama and what that is 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 a prequel to the actual novel series so i'm already dabbling in that world and in that story the novels will come after that as well or i imagine that audio drama might be around even while the novels are out but anyways so i'm already dabbling in that and ac I did that on purpose because you're absolutely right. I am worried about that crossover and that inevitable drop-off. People see my stuff out there. Now, I'm very broad. People know that. Between Atheist Apocalypse, Subject Found, Diary of a Madman, Who Killed Julie, and my patrons getting you and all my exclusive short stories, they know I'm all over the spectrum because fiction just stimulates me, and I want to write everything. Everything I can write, I want to write it. But I had to be smart, and I realized that crossover could be problematic. But unlike a lot of newer writers, I already have a platform. I've been in fiction podcasting for four years now. I've built a following. I do have healthy patronage, those, those people who donate monthly just to help out pay the bills and those other stories out there. So I'm slowly introducing them to the fact that, hey, Paul is also a fantasy writer. And oh, by the way, I hope here's a compelling audio drama to give you an idea. Now that will attract fantasy only fans who don't care about anything else I do. I understand that it will keep it it will maybe push away some of the people who appreciate what I do now. I hope not. But I also hope that it helps some of those who are on the fence about this convert them over because of that relational aspect, relationship marketing. I've been establishing a relationship with these people, some of them for years, and I would like to continue that. And I'm hoping that over time they'll get into that story, even if fantasy isn't necessarily their thing, but it's going to be a slow burn. And I am again, doing that deliberately. Now, there are administrative things I will have to do at some point in the future. Start splitting up newsletter um, audiences, if you will, between the fantasy and the crime and the horror slash thriller stuff. But right now I'm not at that point. It is something that I'm thinking about though. Ultimately, 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 I want to be happy writing what I'm writing. It doesn't mean the day won't come when I don't dabble in romance under a pen name or something, right? It doesn't mean that I won't to make those, to meet those financial goals of independence completely based on uh, my creative pursuits. But for that creative, well, to keep it full, I've got to be doing something I love. And for 30 years, the only thing I love to write consistently over the long haul is either horror slash thrillers and epic fantasy. So that's where my concentration will go. I may need to come up with other pen names. I may do it once. There are a number of examples of authors who jump genres. They do it smart, a series at a time instead of book by book, right? But that doesn't mean that they suffer because they jump genres. And even if they do see a a downturn in numbers between series, it doesn't mean within the series that they have. 
as long as that series is continuing to pr- produce something. And that's my plan for this. I don't see myself ever completely leaving either one of those horror slash thriller and fantasy. Great question. All right. And on to question three. My ultimate dream is to be a career author. I know yours is too, but I really worry about it. I just finished a vacation week where I didn't write at all. I find that with my very full days while I'm working, it's harder for me to procrastinate. I only have so much time to put the words in, to get the words down. But when I have a lot more time, when I have downtime, it seems like I procrastinate even more. Also, it seems like a lot of career authors supplement their income in some way. Whether classes, editing, or some other service, they're not really living off of their words, their books. Do you have any plans like that? Or is your dream more like mine, where you live off of others just enjoying your stories, the stories only you can tell? How do you think you'll get to the point that you're wanting to get to? And that's a great question, an absolutely great question. So depending on where you are in your goals, setting up your goals, envisioning your goals, this may or may not be applicable to you, but I would encourage you, those of you who aren't interested in in becoming a full-time writer one day, right? Whatever that means to you, I would, I would still encourage you to not unplug from this because I think it's an important question to answer because your goals may change. Conditions may change for you. So I would encourage all of you to, to entertain it and, and not just unplug because you don't think that it applies to you because it may not now, but it may someday. So an interesting and timely question, AC, I just uh, read a book and now I'm not into self-help stuff normally, uh, but again, I'm making audiobooks for my books until I can afford a professional narrator. I've got the gear here. You can tell by this pod- podcast that the sound is just as good as a professional studio when it comes to this kind of stuff. So I figured, hey, I need to study audiobooks to see if this is even something I can do. And so I went to Audible and I got the, uh, you know, the 30 day free trial and they give you two credits. And I got Game of Thrones, of course, because I want to hear what epic fantasy audiobooks sound like in the marketplace. But then I got a book that looked interesting because I heard about the first book in this author's lineup. Now there is an expletive in it. So if you've got sensitive ears, be ready, but it's called stop doing that shit. And I had heard about his prior book and I thought, okay, this one sounds interesting. I'm going to give it a try. And I mentioned all of this one to show you how far ahead I start preparing things for what I want, right? Remember what I said earlier about that financial independence is a long-term goal. Well, one of the ways I'm going to get there is through audio. And if I'm going to get into the audio space, which I already am because novel idea to podcast, how to sell more books through podcasting is actually an audio book as well. But in addition to that, um, I need to get into the audio space. Audio sells well and in the, the gross on it is remarkable compared to an ebook or a paperback. So I want to get into the audio space and audio space is the fastest growing space there is for us writers. We need to be in audio space. So one, it was a research reason, but two for you, AC directly to you and my poor physical therapy guy that I talked to yesterday and anybody else who says this, um, empowerment through candor, right? I, I can't be anything but straight with all of you. And as someone who used to work in the behavioral health field, I also want to say this. I want to kick your crutch out. And I don't do this disrespectfully or antagonistically, but I do this because you are the people I serve. The horrible writing family is who I am here for. And sometimes like good uncle advice. You just have to say it straight, right? So 
there's no such thing as procrastination, which is what this guy in Stop Doing That Shit argues. And I liked his theory because it's something I believe uh, as well. There's no such thing as it. In his book, he said it, it, procrastination is just an action. It's a behavior. He likens it to pooping. He said, we all poop. We don't go telling around. We don't walk around telling people that we're poopers, right? But yet, many of us will walk around telling other people, I'm a procrastinator. And I'm not saying AC said that specifically about her in gen- herself in general, but that she just does it in downtime. But it, I, so I want to address everybody with this question. If you use those words, I am a procrastinator, stop. It's a crutch. It's something that we do to ourselves to help ourselves feel better not doing something we know we should be doing for ourselves. Remember when I said people get unhappy about writing? It's because their goals and their behaviors aren't lining up. Well, telling people that we're procrastinators is a subconscious mental defense mechanism to help us uh, make that adjustment. Goals, behaviors not matching. Oh, wait, I'm a procrastinator. Boom. That helps bring behaviors on a level playing field with goals. It's dishonest to do to yourself. It's a bad behavior. So there is no such thing as procrastination. There's just people not doing, period. So do. Now, how do you do? Well, how do you do? (laughs) That depends on you. I argue until the end of days that the mornings are the best time. Before the day starts, I'm not a morning person. I don't care. It's a learned behavior. Get up earlier. You will, over time, you have to give any behavior change at least 30 days of daily implementation. You have to do a certain thing 30 days in a row to even start laying the foundation to change your permanent behaviors. Get up earlier before the family is up and write before you do anything else. Because once everything else starts, boom. It's gone. Do the most important thing first. So if your goal is to be a life writer, that's what you're going to do for a living is write. Then writing is the most important thing you can do. You can't reach that success until you have stuff and lots of stuff out there. So you've got to write. It should be the most important thing you do. Now, if that means that kids get up at six, then you get up at 445. It sucks. Yeah, I know it sucks. Oh, well, what is your goal? What are your behaviors to reaching that goal? Now, it is interesting that AC's specific example is about time off because how does somebody like me address that, right? That's a great, great comment. I plan. Anytime I'm traveling with my wife for her dance stuff, anytime we go on vacation, I'm planning. What am I going to do? So this year is her dance competitions. We were down in Fresno. I made sure that I had my books ready to go with me, the scales in in rip. And I spent that week in the hotel room in the morning after I went downstairs to go get my coffee. I came straight back to the room while she was either sleeping or getting ready for dance competition. And I edited. And then during the day, since I was gone, I made sure I was researching blurbs. Remember me talking about those in the past few episodes? That's what I did. There still has to be writing time. And I use that and I hope it's not missed on people. I get up every single day and the first thing I do is write. And I've done it for so long that it is now an ingrained behavior. All behavior is learned. It is an ingrained behavior. So even though normally I get up at 440 in the morning, Monday through Friday, 440, I don't work until 730. So almost three hours before work to make sure I get my writing in. That doesn't mean I get up at 440 on Saturdays. I don't. I get up when my body wakes up. But the behavior is, oh, up, first thing coffee, and then straight to the computer and get some writing in. Now, that doesn't mean that you take all the fun out of your life. If you're going off the six flags for the day with the family, you get up and get 20 minutes in. Not your normal two hours, but 20 minutes. You have written. That's all you need to do. Go back and listen to my 100 word, 100 word word count day or whatever I titled that episode so long ago. 100 day word count goals or 
not goals, but 100 word count days are fine. If your behavior, your goal is to write every day, which it should be, because if you're serious about this, these are the things you need to do, then even writing 100 words, which most of us can do in less than 10 minutes, is still okay. And then you go off and you have that time. You're on vacation at the beach. You still have that time. Folks, I go camping in the Pacific Northwest. There is no internet signal. I bring a laptop out, a little char- uh, mobile charger, and I write. And sometimes that means we need to leave the campsite and I have to head into town to a coffee place to buy a, a, a dinner for the excuse that I plug in the laptop and recharge it for when we go back to the campsite. But I'm serious about this. When we remove our excuses, that's when we start clearing that path for us to achieve our goals. And it sounds like in an EC situation, it's that disruption in uh, the schedule. When she's working, she's got a framework. But when she's off, that framework is removed because the, the requirements of real life, a job and family are a lot looser now. And c- w- coming with that looseness is the lack of immediacy. We unplug from that structure of life and we forget how terminal life is. None of us are going to live forever. You only have so much time and tomorrow's never guaranteed. It isn't. I said at the very beginning of this year that throughout the year, I was going kind of to go uncle mode on this stuff to the 20 something years, year olds out there. Because if I had had somebody in my twenties to kick me in the ass and say, Paul, you're really passionate about this, but you're finding a whole hell of a lot of excuses to not do this thing. If it was somebody I had a relationship with, I believe my eyes would have been open and I wouldn't have waited until my thirties to start writing again because I had all these reasons why I couldn't. I could. I got distracted by stuff. And some of you are hearing these words and you're not going to change. And then someday in your 40s, long after this show is gone, long after I'm gone, you're, you're going to recall this and you're going to think, I wish I'd listened to Paul. Not because I'm, I know all that. It's because I'm living it. I have wasted my adult life doing a job I hate because I've got bills to pay. When I could have taken a risk all those years ago and at least, if nothing else, started writing all my crappy stuff in my 20s through my 20s into my... So by the time I was in my 30s, mid-30s, maybe I was a little more publishable than having to wait into my 40s to start doing this stuff. What are your goals What are your priorities? Recognize those danger behaviors because it's all behaviors. If you want to be financially independent for based on your creative works, you've got to change those behaviors and put the important things first. My family's important. Yes, so is mine. And on a no shit, you've got to choose this or that thing. My family will always overcome my writing, but over time I will be unfulfilled, right? We're We cannot use extreme examples as if they are routine. You know, a trip to the emergency room usurps your need to write. There's no argument there at all, but you don't have emergency room visits every day or every, even once a year or once a decade. So if you find yourself thinking like that, again, not to AC, but everyone in general, that's a defense mechanism because you know, subconsciously you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing to help you reach your goals because this is hard work. If this were easy, everybody could write a novel and everybody could write a good novel. But we know that's not true. The vast majority of people don't write novels. The vast majority of the people who do try to write novels never finish a single one. This is not easy. So you have to be dedicated to you. Put the important things first. Don't be time bankrupt, you know, wasting your time on things that don't help you take that next step forward. Again, this is not me saying don't enjoy the loved ones in your life. Absolutely would never say that, but that just means you need to get up a little earlier and you need to make that behavior, putting the important things first. And then you can spend the rest of the day at the beach with them guilt-free and happy because you got your writing in. Now, 
the rider to that was the re reality that even published authors with a lot of books have to supplement their income with something. Not everybody does. That's the good news. If you want to, you can, and there's plenty of avenues. You know, uh, the multiple streams of income is a valid argument. That's why most of us work still while we do this, even while we're selling books, even while we have a Patreon, multiple streams of income make you safer. But you could still do it in another way. There's a lot of, re that's one of the reasons going, hearkening back to our earlier com conversation about cross genres, flipping genres. And there's a, uh, an author who I'm not, I can't recall, so I'm not going to say her name. I have interviewed her on this show who writes romance type novels under a pen name because she doesn't want to cross contaminate the uh, spec fiction that she writes. So she's living off her writing solely, but she's taking advantage of the fact that rom romance novels are 50 to 55% of all books ebooks sold for indie authors if you want financial independence your one of your safest bets you got to write good stuff but one of your safest bets is to get into romance so maybe that's something i'll do someday maybe not maybe it will be uh, a cross breed between uh, the fiction and nonfiction. i have been a leader in leadership positions and i teach leadership i've been a leader for 30 years ish and i've been teaching leadership for almost 10 years straight. There's a lot of concepts that I have developed over those 10 years, thousands of managers that I've instructed where I've got a billion stories. I might not do classes and seminars and things like that. I may just come up with a branch of pulsating and write nonfiction leadership stuff, which sells very well, especially with the voice that I have for it and the three idea, book ideas I have for leadership. But so that's, an, that's a question I can't answer yet. But you do have to have multi, multiple avenues. What are those multiple avenues? Only you can answer that. You keep your ear to the ground. Think about the future. Anticipate what's coming. Don't live just in today. But also picture what's going to happen when all, right, all this self-driving cars, if we're not driving, how much more time do we have sitting in our cars? What are we going to be doing with that time? Where can you, the creative, meet that consumer in their car? What technologies would be there, right? These are things to be thinking about. How can you place yourself? But yeah, I definitely agree, AC. I think you can do it based solely on writing. I believe that's what I'm going to do for that financial independence. I don't see myself teaching again, instructional courses and whatnot. I may someday, I don't know, but that's not the plan right now. I, I remain flexible because flexibility is key, but I think there's different ways that we can do it. I don't think there's a one fit solution. Another outstanding question. And that's all of my questions. Thanks so much and keep being epic. This has been author AC Ward. If you want to reach me, I'm AC Ward on Instagram and Facebook. Or you can check out my website, wardabooks.com, or email me directly at wardabooks at gmail.com. Thank you. That's it for this episode. And I want to thank you all. That may have been a harder episode for some of you to hear, but it is called Complete Candor. And I believe in empowering people through candor, being real. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I don't know your specific situation. I do know that I've led people for nearly 30 years and I've talked to thousands of, upon thousands of supervisors of people. I've been in behavior management. I understand the mental health side of it, the behavior side of it. We are our own worst enemies. We make a lot of excuses and we don't recognize when our defense mechanisms kick in. So if you had a strong reaction to this episode, I would ask you to think about that. There's something in there. What are your goals and what are you doing and not doing to meet those goals? That's the big lesson from this episode. I want to thank AC Ward. She was absolutely an amazing guest. 
If you have not heard her, that means you're not listening to the stories we tell. I'm going to urge you, check out that show. It is a fun, once a month show that those of us in the Horrible Writing Writer Support Group on Facebook, if you're not there, why aren't you there yet? Do when we have our monthly writing challenges. We pick some stories, they get put into a podcast form, and AC has appeared a number of times. She's a great person, uh, a great author, and a great human to have in that group. I'm absolutely grateful for our relationship. If you want to follow AC, go over to wardabooks.com. That's W-A-R-D-A-B-O-O-K-S.com. But you can also find her on Facebook at Ward A Books, on Instagram under the name AC Ward. And you can reach her in via email at wardabooks at gmail.com. I hope this episode has been beneficial to everyone, regardless of where you fall on this and how you react to it. Maybe it is a kick in the shins that you needed. I hope for those of you who need that, it is. I hope it reinforces those of you who are making those hard behavior changes to continue on that path. It's not easy, but it's needed. Great job. I hope it was inspiring. We've only got a couple more episodes till episode 100. I'm so thrilled and I am so excited to actually share that all with you when we get to that. It's just something about going into triple digits. Don't judge me. (laughs) Until episode 96, keep being epic. This has been Horrible Writing and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less.